In 2018, in the picturesque Scottish borough of Kirimia, when an offshore oil worker is found dead, there is initial confusion over what could have happened. Then when police look further into the personal lives of those around the victim, it becomes clear that some people are treating Kirimia as their own personal fiefdom and are clearing the field for their own personal relationships. But the net soon closes around these thugs until they have nowhere left to go. This is Murder of Crows. Stephen Donaldson was a 27 year old offshore oil worker earning good money. He had a strong interest in cars and motorbikes. He was a happy man and enjoyed spending his time with his sister and her children. His income allowed him to buy flats in Arbroath and Aberdeen which he rented out. Now, because he spent extended periods away from home, he opted not to live in his own home, instead choosing to stay at his parents' home when he wasn't working. His sister, Laurie Robertson, also lived at the home with her young children. On the evening of June the 6th, 2018, Stephen was playing in the garden with one of his sister's children and all seemed perfectly normal. Soon after, he said he was heading out to see his girlfriend, 19-year-old Tasmin Glass, and he waved as he left the home. The next day, a friend of Stephen's contacted his sister to say that no one had heard from him since the day before. And while no one was panicking, people made more efforts to try to get in touch with him. Laurie contacted the police, who said that if Stephen was planning to meet up with Tasmin Glass, that she should contact her in the first instance, which she did through Facebook Messenger. Glass told her that she and Stephen had been arguing recently, so they arranged to meet somewhere else, but that Stephen had not shown up, and she was concerned when she found out that Stephen had not been heard from since the day before and she was very supportive to Laurie and the family. Unknown to these people, a grim discovery had been made at around 5 a.m. on the morning of the 7th of June at the Lock of Kinordi Nature Reserve near Kirimia. An RSPB, that's Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, for those who don't know, an RSPB warden named Victoria Turnbull had arrived at the na nature reserve with some colleagues to carry out a bird survey. As they arrived in the car park, they saw a burnt out car. Victoria originally thought it was yet another example of the fly tipping 
they had been experiencing at the nature reserve. But as they got closer, it became evident that there was a body next to the car, similarly burnt, but unmistakably a body. Victoria Turnbull immediately called the authorities to report the finding of a body next to a very well burnt car. Kiri Muir, Muir police officer PC Paul Hosking, who was in forefar that morning, received a call that a body had been found. He and a colleague were the first officers on the scene. After moving around the car to check for any other casualties, PC Hosking noticed that the body was seriously charred, but that he could see severe lacerations to the man's back and neck. They immediately cordoned off the car park and placed a further cordon near to Kiri Muir. A post-mortem showed the cause of death to be the result of sharp force trauma to the neck and the body also seemed to be missing its lower legs. Investigations of the car found it to be a BMW 1 series registered to Stephen Donaldson. The police's study of the victimology brought them to Stephen's girlfriend Tasmin Glass with whom Stephen had been having a relationship that seemed to be fizzling out after ongoing arguments. It seemed that Glass owed Stephen £3,000 from insurance after a car she had been driving had been written off. She had also apparently been actively trying to get pregnant to Stephen, believing it would be beneficial if she did. But looking further into Tasman Glass's friendships led to the discovery of a pair of friends who were known to have somewhat primitive ways of settling disagreements. Tasman Glass had apparently, even though her relationship with Stephen Donaldson was technically still on, she had started a relationship with 23-year-old Stephen Dickey. Now, Stephen Dickey's closest friend was Callum Davidson, also 23 years old. To say their personal lives were complicated would be an understatement. There were less love triangles and more love dodecahedrons. But they were also nasty, aggressive bastards with a history of cruelty, intimidation and bullying. James White had been the subject of an ongoing torrent of threats and abuse simply because he was friends with Sam Wilkie, who, bear with me here, was in an on-off relationship with a girl called Nicola Matthews, who was a former partner of Stephen Dickey. Oh, it's like playing Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. White said that he had been called a beast and a rat and was told he was getting it in a spate of incidents in Kirimio. On one occasion, White and Sam Wilkie were in a car together when they were followed by an Audi driven by Callum Davidson. When the vehicle stopped, Dickie jumped out of the Audi and tried to pull open the door of the other car, but White managed to pull it shut. Sam Wilkie told similar, similar stories of threats and aggression. He told of phone calls with Dickie losing his temper on the phone and Davidson in the background threatening to kill Wilkie. It was even suggested that Dickey and Davidson had planned to run Wilkie off the road. Such was their apparent rage at him. 
In another suggestion as to the character of Stephen Dickey and Callum Davidson, 19-year-old Demi Young told of an injury suffered by her kitten that she had named Milo. Having just started to go outdoors, the young cat had suffered a nasty cut to its back leg that had become very dirty. Callum Davidson told the distraught young lady that he could take the kitten to his farm where he could clean up the cut and stitch it. After Demi agreed, Davidson put the kitten into a plastic bag and was seen to kick the bag as Davidson and Dickie went to a van and drove away. Demi Young never saw Milo again. Further stories talked about Davidson and Dickie threatening to beat up Wilkie's mother and burn her house down. What a pair of charmers. So the last time Stephen Donaldson had been seen, he was apparently going to meet Tasman Glass. John Ryan, a roofer who was friends with Donaldson, said that they were due to exchange money regarding the car that Glass had crashed, with Ryan saying that Donaldson was more interested in seeing Glass and trying to fix the relationship than he was bothered about the money. But Glass was seen with some associates. I think you know who I mean. The evening of the attack that suggested that something more sinister may have been afoot. Jack Elder, an agriculture student, saw Glass with Callum Davidson and Stephen Dickey at the Peter Pan Play Park in Kirimior at about 10 p.m. He was certain of their identity because Glass's distinctive orange Vauxhall Corsa was there. He said that Davidson and Glass were in the car with Dickey on his motorbike alongside. Later that night, a meeting was arranged at the play park between Glass and Donaldson. But as soon as Donaldson arrived, Glass sped off, leaving Stephen Donaldson with Dickie and Davidson. Reports show that Davidson broke a baseball bat on Stephen Donaldson and that the ultimate attack actually severed Stephen Donaldson's spinal cord in two different places. It is believed that after the initial attack at the play park to subdue Donaldson, he was then transported to the nature reserve where the more sustained and violent attack occurred with the bat, a knife, and a heavier bladed weapon believed to be an axe or a machete before the car and the victim were both set on fire. When the case came to trial, much of the evidence was circumstantial, but it was plentiful, so much so that the case against Dickie, Davidson and Glass was compelling. But when Davidson admitted hitting Donaldson with the bat, it tied many of the other accounts together and put the two attackers at the scene and Glass there just before the attack. Dickie and Donaldson were both charged with murder while Glass was charged with culpable homicide. The judge, Lord Pentland, explained to the jury that culpable homicide was where a person's death had been caused by an unlawful act which is culpable or blameworthy. The unlawful act must be intentional or at least reckless or grossly careless.
After nine hours of deliberations, all three were found guilty. Dickie and Donaldson received life sentences for murder, while Glass was sentenced to 10 years for culpable homicide. Stephen Alexander Dickey, Callum Davidson and Tasman Glass. The victim impact information describes the lasting devastation that each of you has caused to the parents, sisters and other family of Mr Stephen Donaldson. He was a loved and admired young man. He had established a successful career. He had a wide circle of friends. He had many years of life to look forward to. The wickedness of your crimes caused shock and outrage in the Angus area. No sentence that I can impose will repair the grievous hurt and loss that you have each caused by taking the life of this young man. Stephen Alexander Dickey and Callum Davidson, the punishment for the crime of murder of which you have both been convicted by the jury, is fixed by law. I sentence each of you to imprisonment for life for that offence. I am required also by law to set the minimum period that each of you must serve before the Parole Board for Scotland may consider the possibility of release on licence. In fixing this period, referred to as the punishment part of your life sentences, I must reflect the need for punishment and deterrence. In this context, the law requires me to leave out of account the risk that you may present to public safety in the future. This period should not, therefore, be understood as representing the number of years that you will actually spend in custody. The sentence of the court is one that will endure for the remainder of your lives. It will be for others to decide whether and on what terms, after the expiry of the punishment part, it would be consistent with the protection of public safety for you to be released on licence. In setting the punishment part for each of you, I take account of a number of seriously aggravating factors. First, you used extreme violence in the attacks on Mr Donaldson. Second, you armed yourselves with a variety of weapons including a baseball bat, a knife or knives, and, it can be inferred, another weapon in the nature of an axe or cleaver. Third, the violence was sustained and prolonged. You carried out the attacks in two different locations. Initially, you overpowered Mr Donaldson at the Peter Pan play park. You then abducted him in his vehicle to the car park at the Kinordy Lock Nature Reserve. There, you renewed your assaults on him with unrestrained ferocity. He tried to escape and to defend himself, but you cut him down without mercy, severing his spinal cord in two places with a deadly weapon. You I conclude that without your influence, the fatal attack on Mr Donaldson would not have occurred. You have demonstrated that you are manipulative and devious when it comes to advancing your own interests. In the whole circumstances, I am satisfied that your culpability is at the high end of the range for offences of culpable homicide. I take account of the fact that you were 19 years of age at the material time and of your lack of previous record. The sentence of the court in your case will be one of detention for 10 years. Your sentence will be backdated to 3rd May 2019. In selecting your sentence, I have taken account of the period you spent on remand in 2018. She gave birth to a baby boy, Stephen Donaldson's child, just before going to prison. But there are a couple more details to this case that need to be mentioned. In November 2019, on the day that Glass and Davidson were bidding and failing to have their sentences reduced, Stephen Dickey hanged himself in his cell at Perth Prison. 
he had lost his job as a pass man at the prison and the privileges that went with it the day before. A post-mortem showed that he had been using substances while in prison. In a written judgment, Sheriff Gillian Wade QC said that prison staff could not have prevented Dickey from taking his own life. She wrote, I accepted the submission of the procurator fiscal to the effect that the deceased was unlikely to have been acting under some sort of psychosis or hallucination at the time of his death, as he had left a number of notes for his friends and family and specific directions about what he wished to be done with his property. It was therefore clear that whatever his motivation, the deceased's actions in taking his life were deliberate and planned. It is quite impossible for me to find any causal link between the consumption of these substances and the deceased's death on the basis of the evidence before me. All that can be said with certainty is that the deceased was clearly using drugs within the prison system while expressly denying that this was the case. He had no history of substance abuse and not sought help for any such problem. There was no overt sign that he was ever under the effects of any substance and on the contrary seems to have held a position of responsibility within the prison without being compromised by apparent substance misuse. There are many factors which could have affected the deceased, such as the loss of his job as a pass man, his ingestion of drugs with unknown consequences, the lack of prospects of an appeal, or simply the prospect of having to sp spend a lengthy period of time in custody. None of these on their own seem to have been the motivating factor behind the deceased's actions and any attempt to attribute a motive would be speculation. On the basis of the evidence I cannot suggest any recommendations of the sort suggested which might realistically have prevented this or other deaths in similar circumstances. The other fact to be noted regarding the tragic death of Stephen Donaldson is that his erstwhile girlfriend Tasmin Glass, guilty of his culpable homicide, is set for day release after serving less than half of the 10-year sentence she received in 2019. Relatives of Stephen Donaldson say they were disgusted after being made aware of the situation through the victim notification scheme. A family spokesperson said as Stephen's family and friends, we are absolutely disgusted to be informed that Tasman Glass, the person who orchestrated Stephen's murder, is eligible for day release from prison just four years into her sentence. While we appreciate that this follows procedures in place, we feel that this is completely disrespectful to Stephen and his family and suggests that his life was not valued. It is of huge concern to us that anyone who is convicted of such a crime can be within our community 
after such a short time. As a family, we were asked if we wanted to make representations in regards to her release. And despite having done this, it would appear that our views have not been considered or taken seriously. Nor has the safety of ourselves or of the wider community. According to the Scottish Prison Service, her initial leave will be accompanied by a prison officer, followed by unaccompanied day release, and then overnight stays at home. And this brings us right up to date with this horrifying and cruel case. I'd love to know what you guys think about it in the comments. But with that said, that's where today's story will end. This video is unquestionably dedicated to Stephen Donaldson, who was cruelly battered, slashed and burned by two thugs in a scheme devised by a woman scorned. I hope his family find ways to cope, even though their efforts will no doubt be affected by the decision to grant day release to Tasmin Glass. I wish the friends and family of Stephen Donaldson nothing but compassion and good wishes. Thank you for watching another episode of Murder of Crows. I'm Steve. Samson was there and now he's just over there. And we will see you when we see you. Say that.